Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Wells Fargo, New Jersey Resources, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Adler Aphasia Center, the New Jersey State Nurses Association, and the Institute for Nurses, advocating, positioning, educating NJ's RNs, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community, and by Partners for Health Foundation. Promotional support provided by Jaffe Communications, where business, media, and government converge in New Jersey. And by Meadowlands Regional Chamber, building essential connections that drive business growth. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. We're pleased to be joined by uh, Nancy Cantor, who is the chancellor of Rutgers University, in Newark, and uh, uh, one of the editors, one of the two editors of our compelling interest, the value of diversity for democracy and a prosperous society. Good to see you, Nancy. Great to see you. It's a great city we are in. We're here at NJ Pack, right? It's a wonderful city we're in. I mean, Newark, New Jersey is just such a representation of all the opportunity and the challenges that so, this country faces. Sorry for interrupting. Let's talk about Rutgers Newark as someone who knows it well, who's taught there in the past, who understands the culture. But for those who may not understand, uh, U.S. News and World Report says it's one of the most diverse campuses in the nation. It's more than that, but what does that mean? So the diversity of Rutgers Newark is phenomenal because it represents a microcosm of the diversity of this country. And in fact, what we all need to be paying attention to and appreciating in a positive way is the opportunity that that diversity of the next generation really means. We have no, for example, in our institution of 12,000 students, we have no racial or ethnic majority group. We have tons of languages represented, cultural heritages, lots of students from low-income families for whom this is a real opportunity. And Rutgers Newark has been that way for generations in terms of being a place of opportunity. And, you know, when I think of higher education, I think of it as the royal road to opportunity. Say so the royal road. The royal road to opportunity. If you think about what has built this country and its prosperity and its and its social value, what has built it, is that each generation has put its mark by striving to prosper, striving to have families prosper. And education's been at the heart of that. You know, we've had, we've had people come on here. We actually had someone who's been a success in, in social uh, um, media and marketing who said, you know what, I went to college and it was fine, but I gotta tell you something, I think I could have made millions of dollars anyway if I never went to uh, college, and I think it's overrated. And a lot of people waste their money and save a lot of money to have their kids do it. And we went back and forth because you know where I'm coming from on I this. Do. Go ahead. No, I, I couldn't disagree more. I mean, that is, this country's prosperity has been built on educating each generation and providing more opportunity. And in a knowledge economy, it couldn't be more important. You simply can't survive. And most importantly, the country isn't going to survive if we leave so much talent on the sidelines. We are undereducating so many students in our K-12 system, in higher education. We're not looking for mm. patterns of where, for example, first generation families, where, where do their students go? They go to community colleges. So at Rutgers Newark, for example, and many places around the country are doing this, we're really looking for amazing talent in first-generation students in community colleges who then transfer to us and go on in science and technology and engineering and mathematics or in the arts. And if they had never done and that, they, what would happen? There's no entry into prosperity in a global knowledge economy without an advanced degree. And we know 
that higher education is in fact more and more a ticket to that. That's why it's so important that we make it available for people. But, but you know, Nancy, you talk about the economics of it, which is huge. The opportunity is created because one, in fact, right. goes to um, a, a two and a four, ultimately a four year uh, higher education experience. But the other part of it that strikes me about Rutgers Newark, and I remember being on campus a few years back, and I remember teaching a, a course in the business school and seeing my class, first class, and I'm thinking, my God, and the diversity was blowing me away. And I thought, these students who are working in group projects, now without going into detail, they're working in group projects. And immediately the thing that struck me is they have to interact with other people who are exactly. unlike them. Exactly. And in and of itself, talk about that skill set. That is so important. So one of the things that's really important is the notion that this country is in a moment of divisive division. P.S., right? we're in the final stretches of a 2006 presidential election. This will be seen afterwards. Go to your point. <laughs> <laughs> Timing could not be better. Timing could not be better. <clears throat> Higher education is one of the few American institutions where we can really learn to cross boundaries of difference, right? We don't naturally do it. We live in highly separated, one might even say often segregated communities. Balkanized. We're balkanized. We don't vote together. We don't go to faith institutions together. We don't have to share always the same language. We don't get educated together in K-12. And then somehow we're expected to create one out of many, right? E pluribus unum, that's the American dream. So the American dream is fulfilled by higher education in both its aspects, both the land of opportunity, mm -hmm. and we spoke about that earlier. Economics. But it's also e pluribus unum. It's how do we come together? And as you well know, 24-7, we're in a barrage of coming apart. We're, we're taken over with the notion that we're not a collective. We're not a people who depend on each other. We're a people who are in a zero-sum mentality If you're with getting each something, other. Nancy, that means it's coming away from, from me. Exactly. And I got to take it back from you. When, in fact... There's lots of evidence, and higher education is the place to do, one of the places to do this. The military, interestingly, also is a place where you can do this. There's lots of evidence that there is a diversity bonus. Scott Page, a fabulous psych, uh, faculty member at University of Michigan, a good friend of mine, talks about the diversity bonus that comes in group problem solving <laughs> by having people with different identities, cognitive diversity, come together. Well, that's at its best what sure. higher education does. But the thing I would want to say about that is none of this comes automatically. You don't just put people in a room and they get along, right? You don't just put people in a room and they feed off each other's diverse perspectives. You have to create an environment. You have to create an environment. Facilitate it, promote it, foster it. Exactly. By the way, this book, give me a minute on this. So this is the inaugural volume supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation of what will be a 15-year book series on the compelling interest of diversity. And the notion really is we have a diversity explosion in this country. By mid-century, we will be a majority-minority um, majority country. Non-white. Right? Majority non-white. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to continue to view it as a threat? Or are we going to see the opportunity the opportunity to leverage diversity for prosperity, to leverage diversity for social good, mm. to leverage diversity to come together, yeah. to be creative. For example, think about the arts. We are part of the renovation in downtown Newark of, of the great historic Haynes, Haynes building. Right. We're going to have 50,000 square feet in there of university community arts collaboratory because the arts is really broadly defined, is really one of the ways that we actually do express yeah. who we are and express it to each other. Nancy Cantor is the uh, chancellor of Rutgers, Newark, one of the most diverse campuses in the United States of America doing important work here in the city, across the state and the nation. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Appreciate being partners with you here at NJPAC. It's great to be here. We'll be right back. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome, folks. Steve Adubato here. Uh, for those of you who consistently watch our program, you know that 
I've been asking people about uh, the most significant lesson they've learned about leadership for a long time. And one of the reasons we've been doing that is because for the last couple of years I've been working on a book called Lessons in Leadership. And the first chapter in this book, Lessons in Leadership, right here, takes all of those quotes about leadership from hundreds of people and condenses them, the best that we thought we had. And um, we break them down and try to teach people through that. And I wanted to bring on my colleague, Mary Gamba, who is the Director of Development at Stand and Deliver, to join me in this segment so we can make sense of what we've heard from those experts, those leaders of every stripe, and also offer some lessons for folks. How are you doing? Very good. How are you? Good. So I didn't ask you this question. The number one leadership lesson <laughs> that you have learned. No, seriously, I've been doing this with all kinds of people. Mary has oh. been working with me for 16, 17 years. Mm -hmm. She runs our Stand and Deliver not-for-profit program with youth leaders, 500 every year. We teach them all kinds of leadership skills. Number mm -hmm. one leadership lesson you've learned is? Um, I would have to say you can't lead others until you learn to lead yourself. Which I think is a chapter in the book. What does that mean for it you, is. though? It uh, is. For me, it took me a lot of time to realize that you need to know who you are, be true to yourself, and compose yourself a certain way, be able to adapt to situations when things go wrong. And I think that as far as leadership goes, that's a very important leader leadership trait. And then once you get to that point, anything else is possible because then you're humble enough to realize, hey, I made a mistake. I'm going to lead myself, and then I can lead others. Mary and I talk about this a lot, and um, one of the first things, one of the first clips you're going to see, or one of the first excerpts you're going to see in terms of leadership lessons, really goes to a lot of what mm -hmm. Mary just said. It comes from an extraordinary interview we did with Eric Legrand, who was 25, 26 years of age right now, but at 20 years of age, played for Rutgers University, one of the stars there, uh, playing Army. A terrible uh, collision on the field. Um, and his life was changed forever, but he was sitting across from us, right in the mm -hmm. studio, I believe, and um, because he can no longer walk, right? no longer obviously play football, mm -hmm. but he's a broadcaster, radio broadcaster. He loves football, he loves sports, and he's a motivational speaker. <clears throat> and you're going to see that this one is a, the leadership lesson is attitude is everything when it comes to leadership and in life. He said, if you're going to lead people, this is Eric Legrand from uh, Rutgers University, he's a football, was a football player there, now a motivational speaker. He said, if you're going to lead people, you need to prove to those people that you are in the battle with them. I could have given up a long time ago, but I decided not to. Show that you can do it, and then people will believe in you. Attitude is everything, everything Mary? Absolutely everything. Whether you are a young adult, whether you are in business, if you don't have a good attitude and if you don't show others that, hey, my attitude is going to be an example of what I expect from you, you're going to fail. You're destined to fail. Bad things happen. Things go wrong. Eric Legrand, you can't get... I, I have no idea how he does what he does every day, and he does it with a positive attitude, and that's just an amazing leadership trait. Well, let's talk about that, because mm -hmm. in, in the book, Lessons in Leadership, uh, we talk about the fact, mm -hmm. and Mary worked with me with Vic Victoria Eisenstein, part of our team as well, for about two years. Yeah. And I disclose in the book an awful lot, because when you, you lead, things go wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of what happens, but how you choose to deal with it. You sure. and I have had this conversation. Absolutely. I'll say, Mary, such and such happened. Why did mm -hmm. that happen? Why did she do this? Why did he do that? And you're like, what? Right. How long are we going to do this, Steve? Mm -hmm. Why don't you look at what the positives are and how we can turn this into something positive? I'm like, Mary, right. like, what do you always wake up on the, <laughs> the right side of the bed? Why do you do that? And where did that come from? Um, I, just growing up, everything was very positive with the reinforcement in my life. And when things go wrong, of course, first you have to address the problem. You need to say, this went wrong. I'm not happy about it. Oftentimes, whomever it is that you're speaking to is also just as equally not as happy about it. But then get past it and then come up with solutions. Ask the person to come up with solutions. But the sooner you get past the anger and the disappointment and the rage, the quicker you can get to a solution in the end of the day. Uh, very true. And by the mm -hmm. way, when it comes to this attitude thing, we work on it every day. Mm -hmm. um, and someone says, oh, yeah, I got a great attitude. I'm like, yep, you'll be tested tomorrow. And I still am working on no, my... No, and seriously, every single day, as soon as I wake up, as we all do, it's a brand new day. And I say to myself every single morning, it is a good day. I'm here. I'm going to make the best of it, whether I'm tired, whether I have a headache, whether I don't feel that well. I go into it with that attitude, and it really makes a difference. And she does live it every day. Let's try mm -hmm. this one. This is under the category of great leaders are lifelong learners. It's an important chapter in the book, but more importantly, we got a great quote from Barry Ostrowski, president and CEO of 
RWJ Barnabas Health. And this is what Barry said. You'll see the quote right here. He said, listen to as many people within your organization as you can. Don't let your confidence and your own judgment overtake the value of the information you get from the people who are working for you. So what happens, Mary, if the leader says, I know the way to go. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me. That's why I'm the CEO, you say. You're going to miss out on a lot of other great ideas, a lot of other opportunities. You may not see something the way that someone else sees it. You don't always have to take the person's advice or idea as a leader, but keep taking it into consideration will really help you to see the bigger picture. And it is true because um, I'm going to tell you, some of us who think we know and we mm -hmm. think leadership is about being the boss, mm -hmm. being the boss isn't being a leader. Exactly. That's just the person who tells mm -hmm. people what to do. Uh, and the other thing about being a lifelong leader, I'm going to share this real quick. One of the things in the book that, that we talk about is people who say, I've learned enough. I don't need to know anymore. And I've, I do a lot of executive coaching, as you know. And I talked mm -hmm. about a client who one time told me he was in his 50s. And he yeah. said, um, I don't need to be coached by you or anyone else because, quote, I'm as good as I'm ever going to get. Right. And then I told you, what about that guy? Mm -hmm. That guy wanted to be the top, top person. Yeah. You're Could not going to get there. Why not? You, you are not going to get there. You need to be open-minded. You need to understand that there's always new lessons to be learned. There's always new tools that you can put into your wheelhouse as you work every day. Everyone needs practice. Everyone can get better, no matter whether you're the president of the United States or whether you're the CEO of an organization. There's always room for growth. And by the way, speaking of that, Victoria just reminded me, uh, some of the things we can do to keep learning and growing, what do they include? Um, Really, for me, it's finding new books, talking to others, learning about others' leadership styles. I'm always looking for uh, different books that highlight different things. I had mentioned to you the other day a book called Grit. Mm. And yeah, and just reading what other leaders have to say, what other uh, journalists have to say. It's really just staying informed and being open-minded to understand that maybe there's a different way you can think about things. One, one more quickie. Uh, I argued in the book, and there's a chapter called Great Leaders Build Other Leaders. And our friend Patrick Dunnigan mm -hmm. over at uh, Gibbon said this. Relentless follow-up is the most effective uh, leadership best practice. Successful leaders never cease to push, cajole, encourage, mm -hmm. and inspire. Persistence and perseverance are essential. Developing future leaders. We have a great team here at the Caucus Educational Corporation. You notice everyone is trying to step up to take mm -hmm. on a new role, new responsibilities, as opposed to saying, well, I'm a good leader, I'm good, leave me alone. That doesn't work. No, it definitely doesn't work, especially in a smaller organization. Everyone needs to do their part. No one is above sending a FedEx or responding to an email. It's an all hands on deck. If something goes wrong, if something goes right, if there's an opportunity to go in and help one another, being there to help one another and then also give constructive feedback and criticism so someone can learn and grow in the process is key. And by the way, one more before we get out of here. Uh, one of the chapters I enjoy the most, it wasn't fun to write, but it was called You Can't Lead Others Until You Lead Yourself. And mm -hmm. that chapter in the book, and by the way, go on our website, um, steveautobato.org. It's our nonprofit. You will find lots of free tips here. We're not looking to sell mm -hmm. books to anybody. <laughs> and in that chapter... I talk an awful lot about the mistakes I've made as a leader, but it is the only way, and I admit them, I acknowledge them, mm -hmm. because I'm convinced that the only way you grow as a leader is to acknowledge your own mistakes, right. take full responsibility mm -hmm. for them, instead of pinning it on other people, throwing other people under the bus and saying, I'm the leader, don't blame me. It doesn't right. work that way. It definitely doesn't work that way. Uh, we call it the blame game a lot when we yep. do our coaching and consulting work. And playing the blame game, again, the other person is going to get defensive. They're going to shut down. Owning your part in whatever it is that went wrong and then working together as a team to get past it is really important. Sounds so simple, especially when it yeah. comes from Mary Gamba, who <laughs> lives it every day. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Mary. Lessons in leadership, particularly go on our website and get free information about... Uh, they're not just lessons in leadership, they're lessons in life. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. It is our honor and pleasure to introduce the 2016-2017 New Jersey State Teacher of the Year at the uh, NJEA convention here in Atlantic City. She is Arjean Safari. First, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. What was it like when you were told that you were, in fact, the Teacher of the Year? Oh, it was all sorts of emotions. I was super excited. Um, I couldn't believe it. I felt truly honored and blessed, um, and also a little scared <laughs> of the amount of responsibility that this brings. Arjean came to the United States with her husband in 1994, immigrated to the United, United States from Moscow. Describe coming to this country in, in 1994 
Um, first of all, you had been in love with music since you were six years old. Yes, I studied music since I was six, professionally, actually. Um, and when, when I came to this country with my husband and my newborn daughter, um, it was a pretty scary experience because I was a refugee and I was really hoping to find freedom and, you know, all the dreams of becoming uh, an American and taking advantage of all the opportunities that are here. Um, and we really didn't have anything. There was really no money, no connections. So it was a challenge. It was a big challenge. But um, I think it's all those hard times that I had to go through that make this journey even more appealing and special to me. You told me before we got on the air that you love music as far back as you can remember. But your love of teaching. My love of teaching came later. I uh, always thought I was going to be a performer. I didn't think I would be a teacher. Um, so when I came to this country, I was trying to find myself looking to do different things. I went to school to study language, ended up getting a, another degree in finance and business. And while I was at school, I had different gigs and jobs as a musician. And I realized how much I loved doing it. And after graduating from college, I actually started to work in business. Um, actually, was on Wall Street for a little bit. And meanwhile, I was doing these different things and directing musicals. And when I finally did um, a direct musical with a high school level, I fell in love with the experience of just working with these kids and making them feel special about themselves. And that gradually transformed um, me into wanting to do music, teaching. But I think the final moment was when I um, met this young girl in eighth grade and she lost her father to 9-11, but she wanted to be a professional musician. And I decided to help her to get into this top performing school in New York City. And I was working with her um, to prepare her for this experience. It's a non-tuition free school if you get in. And she got into the school. And I can't tell you how I felt when she got into the school. It was nothing compared to any of the performing experiences I had. So I think that's when I knew. And I decided to just become a teacher after that. And I never looked back. It's got to be very rewarding for you. Um, absolutely. Uh, there is no way I can describe the feeling when you get those Try. kids to... Well, I just... When they come to you and they say that, you know, you changed my life, you transformed me, I want to do what you do, I never thought I would be uh, looking at the music or listening to the music the same way. This, that makes... That, that's it. That's why we are in this profession. That's why we do what we do. And the passion that I transform to my students, I transfer my love for music. I cannot imagine doing anything more rewarding. It, you can't. It, you can. So, it, so you could perform uh, at Carnegie Hall. You could perform at the most extraordinary venue with your beautiful music because you are so talented. Or you could transform the life of a young person and have them say, I've been turned on to music in a way I never could have imagined. I want to pursue um, a career in music. And you would choose the latter? Absolutely, because you are changing someone else's life, because you are leaving a legacy. Because these are the people who will come and tell you that you had an influence in their lives. Yeah. And I don't know how to ex explain, explain this, but yes, the performing experiences are great. You, you reach out to the audiences. You make them feel different. You make them think about something differently. But when you actually reach to the soul and heart of the student, and you make them feel better about themselves, you make them realize their passions, their talents that they never even knew they had, don't you think that's the best transformative experience one Nothing can have? Nothing better. Nothing better. So let me ask you. You came to this country uh, 22, 23 years ago, right? Did you envision or was it on your list of accomplishments? I want to become the New Jersey State teacher. You're laughing already. Teacher of the year. Did you say that's, that's what I want to be? No, absolutely not. Um, what I knew that I wanted to be is someone who will make a difference. I knew that. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to do something for the community and for this country. Because anyone who comes to this country and takes advantage of those opportunities is blessed to have 
this incredible country and to be able to really you know, explore those opportunities. I, I never had an opportunity would, like this. Sorry, Fred, would you have not had, I don't want to be overly philosophical or political, but when you were in Moscow, or you, if you were there today, you don't know because you're here in the United States doing great things, would you have been able to make the difference that you are making today here, back there? I would love to think so. Um, however, uh, it was a different climate. Um, it was very different to even feel that you can do what you want to do. Here, it's a land of opportunities. I don't think uh, we realize that. People who are born in this country yeah, take it for granted. You no, don't. I don't take it for granted. I don't take a single day for granted. And that's how I approach my teaching, too. I don't walk into the classroom and say, oh, here, another teaching day. I actually take every day to use that as an opportunity to do something special. As the... Uh Teacher of the Year in the state as someone who's made a difference in the lives of many. A, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us who have children in public schools. Um, all of us who have children. Thank you. All of us who love music. But the other thing I'm going to ask you is this. What's the number one lesson you've learned about being a leader? The best thing about being a leader is being able to inspire people. If you're able to inspire other people, that that is the best leadership one can ever imagine. It's not a position, it's not a job, it's an ability to influence other people and to make them better, and to inspire and to lead them in the best way that you can, and to make them believe in themselves more than they can possibly imagine. Congratulations, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Steve, Thank appreciate you. it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Wells Fargo, New Jersey Resources, New Jersey Sharing Network, Adler Aphasia Center, the New Jersey State Nurses Association, and the Institute for Nurses, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, and by Partners for Health Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.